Neither the Oxford comma, Hitler, or Stalin were injured during the making of this Books and Beer Hangout. But I am Evo Terra, and this is the Books and Beer Hangout. Welcome to another episode of the Books and Beer Hangout, our quest into the underbelly of the indie publishing world. My name is Jeff Moriarty with ePublish Unum, and our topic this evening is how to keep people talking about you by reinventing yourself as an author. Our guest is Mignon Fogarty, author, entrepreneur, and grammar girl. Uh, Mignon, please introduce yourself and tell us what tasty, tasty beverage you are partaking of this evening. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Thank you for having me. I am uh, Mignon Fogarty, and I am incredibly boring. I am drinking water <laughs> because I live in Reno. It's very dry here, so I get thirsty. <laughs> and I'm allergic to beer. So. A more horrible cross to bear I cannot imagine than an allergy to beer. So I will shoulder up your part of the uh, the burden here and drink a uh, Hoptimum, which I somehow never tried before. Not too bad. Uh, Sierra Nevada, not normally my go-to brewery, but pretty nice. What you got, Evo? I'm going to back that up with another IPA. This is the Frog's Breath. It's done by the Coronado Brewing Company. Pale ale with spices, beer, uh, and kefir lime leaf, whatever the heck that happens to be. But anyhow, tasty enough. Very nice. All right, so I will kick things off. So, Mignon, your last book was last, your most recent book was last summer. Yet, everywhere I go, everyone's talking about you. I go down to the store, they're talking about Mignon. I go to the gas station, they're talking about Mignon. How do you do it? How are you keeping people talking about you? <laughs> no, they're not. Well, I try though. I mean, I'm, I'm on a, you know, I spend a lot of time on social media, probably half my time on Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, Pinterest, those are the primary ones, really Twitter and Facebook for the most part. But then I do a weekly podcast, you know, I do the Grammar Girl podcast every week and I have a weekly email newsletter. So I am constantly online, constantly posting new information or sometimes reruns now because I've been, I've been Grammar Girl for almost seven years. I just realized the end of July, it's going to be seven years. So I have, I'm, Tonight's episode, I think, is number 372, the 372nd Grammar Girl podcast. So, and I do that every week. So I'm always putting new information out there. It's harder lately to have it be tied to the book because I haven't had a new book out for a year. So, you know, but I always try to, you know, a lot of times people ask questions. So if they ask the question that was covered in one of my books, which many things have been, then I try to say, oh, well, I covered that in my book. <laughs> and here's the answer. So <laughs> I would imagine you have a fair number of people who know you as, or know of you, as Jeff is talking about, who discover you for the podcast uh, or some other venue and then go, oh, and you also have books? I mean, they don't, probably don't know that automatically. Actually, the frustrating thing for me and the thing I always forget is I forget to tell people in one venue that I'm in another venue. So yeah. there are people on Twitter who have no idea that I have a podcast. And there are people who listen to the podcast that have no idea I'm on Twitter. And then, you know, everywhere they don't know how books. So um, it, I have to often remind myself to cross promote like that. Well, it's a very difficult thing for a lot of authors to figure out is how do you talk about yourself in social channels, in email, in various things, and, and still try and be an interesting person that's not just saying constantly, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, and that's you're not saying that. You're giving people lots and lots of content, and then occasionally you say, oh, and, and the fact is you forget to do it sometimes. <laughs> Go buy the book, the next one. I do, yeah. Um... It's, yeah, it's, it's really easy when people, pretty much the only time I remember to do it is when people ask me a question and I think, oh, yeah, that was in my book. <laughs> so, and often, you know, I will go back through my own feeds, my own Twitter feed and my own Facebook feed every, maybe once a month and think, would I follow this person? You know, is this person interesting? And make sure that I'm not being annoying or talking about one thing too much or you know, one thing, too, is I'll find that I'll respond to people a lot, but I don't always post enough. So if I see I have 20 responses to one original post, I'll try to step it up on the post. Sure. Well, you're the consummate engager. You uh, Obviously, you're out responding to people constantly and putting out new content. But when you are sitting in the mode of it's time for a book again, do you consider yourself an author, or these days is that more of a publisher? 
I consider myself more an author than a publisher, but probably more a marketer than both. I mean, it's grammar that I'm talking about. It's language. I'm not making up new information. I'm presenting information that already exists and trying to do that in a compelling, exciting, fun, interesting way. So in a lot of ways, it's really more marketing than writing in my mind. And then, of course, as you know, I'm the founder of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network where we have, I've lost count, like 13 or 14 other hosts who do other podcasts, and many of them have books now. So I am sort of part of that business that is a publisher for them. But um, Macmillan is my partner in that whole enterprise, and they handle the whole publishing part of it. Hmm. See, that's interesting because when I was catching up on what you've been doing, the quick and dirty tips pops right up, and you look like you're the publisher. You look like you're the orchestrator for all of these, so it looks like your empire has gone far beyond just grammar uh, and leveraging your original book to drive all of these other titles and other areas of interest. Well, I was. For the first couple of years, I ran the day-to-day -day operation of the network, and it just got too big for one person to do. And Grammar Girl was also growing at the same time. So at some point I had to decide whether I wanted to devote all my attention to this growing Grammar Girl brand, for lack of a better word, and or to be a full-time entrepreneur and run this massively growing publishing web podcasting enterprise, which is, you know, is a huge business on its own. Right now there are three full-time people at Macmillan who work on the quick and dirty tips um, business. You know, it's not, it's not an, a small thing. So, you know, I had to choose and I, it made more sense for me to be Grammar Girl because, you know, no one else can really do that. So. <laughs> Earlier you said that you're not, you're writing about grammar and you're not the person who's making up the new rules about grammar. Um, who is? I'm ready to take some notes. Who's making up <laughs> these rules about grammar that I'm not following? There's an extraordinary long history of um, people who make up the rules. Uh, the, some of my favorites, modern favorites, are um, Garner's Modern American Usage. Brian Garner is a prolific usage expert. He's also a lawyer who does um, writing seminars for lawyers. Who, oh, you know, he sounds fascinating already. Please <laughs> tell me no more. <laughs> he is. He's one of my heroes. In fact, in the Grammar Devotional, one of my books, he is listed as a grammar rock star. <laughs> So when we so, said that Mignon was doing interesting, exciting things on her content, we meant that she is. She may read really terribly boring stuff, but she makes it fun and interesting for all of you. That's true. Oh. Actually, that book is more than 900 pages of teeny tiny font. And then and the, there's the Merriam-Webster Dictionary of English Usage, which is the same thing, and will take you back through, you know, back to the 1700s about the history of some word. And I read all that stuff because I find it fascinating, and then I try to translate it for you know the average person who might not be so fascinated by the dry details but there are just fascinating nuggets in every one of those stories and my job is to find them and make them well you're, you're appealing to another side of me that loves people's individual geekery you know just, <laughs> it, it's amazing what lights some people up that would cause other people to completely flatline and this is obviously an area of passion for you <laughs> yes. and good for I... you a couple of weeks ago, I uh, I gave an interview to um, CNBC, and I was talking to my husband beforehand, and I said, I just I just hope they let me talk about Noah Webster. <laughs> he just started cracking up. Yeah. Okay, so I was going to ask you if, after so many years of Grammar Girl, you felt that you were running out of material to talk about. If you were looking at a new book, if you were going to try to go into a different direction, but it sounds like you're kind of digging deeper with some of this content. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's really tough because sometimes I just do straight reruns because, gosh, it's been four years since I covered semicolons and the original episode was really good, you know, but often, you know, I'll go, I go through the comments on the website and see if there are things that people were confused about or had additional questions, so I'll, I'll expand a show to answer those, but my favorite these days are the ones that have a news hook, you know, it's been a couple years now, but, you know, uh, Donald Trump, on The Apprentice corrected Cindy Lauper. He said she, she said she felt bad. And he goes, no, you feel badly. And he was actually wrong. He humiliated her and he was the one who was wrong. And so that's a great news hook to get into that discussion about bad versus badly. So I'm always looking for things like that and it can be a fun new twist on an older topic that I've already covered. 
Uh, well, speaking of geekery, you're taking that up a level because just doing, just being Grammar Girl wasn't enough. Now you've gone into app development. Tell us about this thing called Grammar Pop. Yes, I'm so excited. I'm making an, a game, an iPad game, and called Grammar Pop, and I hope it'll be out on the other um, platforms really soon. And we're getting ready to. We were supposed to submit it to. Apple this week. It might be next week because you know how those things go. But um, it's this game where there are clouds and there's a there's a sentence with uh, all it's a sentence with words. Each word is in a cloud, and okay. you have to um, match it to its right part of speech. So like pick out all the nouns and pick out all the verbs. And there's really no other game like it that I'm aware of. And it's just it's it's a blast. You pop the clouds and they make a noise and. And I've just I've been developing it for the last year, and it was I think it was equally challenging to learn to make an app and develop the game from the computer side, but also to classify all the words. There are fourteen thousand words in the sentence, and I classified them all <laughs> with wow. some help with some help from a linguist who I Neil Whitman who I. Um, brought on board because it was actually getting too hard <laughs> and I couldn't do it all. But uh, so I, he, he consulted and helped me with some of the tougher ones. And, you know, we ended up eliminating sentences that were ambiguous. It, it turns out there are different schools of thought about parts of speech. Like, who knew? But um, so, but it's this fun iPad game and we sent it out to 50 beta testers and they loved it. And teachers are really excited about like I made it for myself because it's the kind of word game that I would want to play. But it turns out teachers are really excited about it. So uh, it's called Grammar Pop. It's going to be for the iPad first, but it really um, lots of um, app, you know Android and stuff, Kindle Fire and stuff like that very soon afterward. So is this a single person game? Is it a is a play collaborative? What are we trying to, try to do? It is a single person game. Okay. So it, yeah, it doesn't have the multiplayer. You can't sh you know, share your results with friends. But I, d I developed it using a tool called Game Salad, which lets you, um, like a, an average person who doesn't know a coding language, make an app. And it's been a great experience. It actually reminds me of my early days podcasting, because Game Salad has fantastic forums where you can go ask people for help. You know, like in the early days of podcasting, everyone like supported each other. Game Salad's a lot like that. So if you're stuck, you can go like, oh, what is this variable doing? I don't understand. And someone will help you. So. It's interesting the way you just described the process because it sounded like the publishing process for a book. You had this idea and you wrote it and you brought in an editor and you had somebody help check everything that you couldn't check on your own. And then you had your... Uh, your beta readers that went out and tested it and, and everything else. It sounds like a just a modern version, a more interactive version of publishing a book. It's very true. I've been surprised how much like writing a book it was. Um, it's been about as much work as writing two books, actually. But um, yeah, it it was it very much ended up feeling like the book writing process. You're right. You have to proof it. You know, like with when you a lot of people don't realize when you write a book, you you end up reading the darn thing like eight times because you're proofing it and then your editor sends it back to you and you read it over and over and over again. And it's the same with the game. You have to test it over and over again until you're kind of sick of it. Like by the time a book, I write a book and it comes out, I'm just so sick of it. And then like a year later, I'll revisit and go, hey, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> That's kind of good. Yeah, perspective is a wonderful thing on that. And uh, definitely. Well, Mignon, thank you very much for being on the program with us today. Thank you for having me. And uh, we will have some show notes. We will have links to Mignon's stuff, the Grammar Girl website, the quick and dirty tips, the hopefully something more about this grammar pop if we can have it up by then. I don't know what the timing is, but we'll we'll see. You can stay tuned with us and, and check that kind of stuff out. Also, in news from the EPU side of things, uh, this week, if you happen to be in Phoenix, Thursday, Jeff and I are teaching a class at Changing Hands Bookstore about tools for writers of the 21st century. It's the first of a three-part series of classes we're doing, so if you are local or if you know anyone in Phoenix who would like to go to these sorts of things, Check out our website at epublishunum.com for more information about that. So, with that, the show is over. The Books and Beer Hangout is a production of ePublish Unum. We create workshops, guidebooks, and roadmaps so authors can cut through the complexity of indie publishing. Want to get started? Check out the website, ePublishUnum.com. For Jeff Moyarty, I'm Evo Terra. 
Thanks for being a part of the show.